Um, today we are in our series, Sermon on the Mountain. Today we're going to be talking about humility. Humility. What a fun topic to talk about, right? We're, we're living in a day and an age where everybody wants to be raised up. They want to be top dog. They want to be most popular. They want the most likes. They, you know, they want to go viral. They, they want their voice to be heard over everybody else's voice. Everybody wants to use other people as stepping stones so they can get a higher level of attaining something. And then, you know, and I'm, I'm talking about before Jesus came, <laughs> right? Not just now, but before Jesus came. And then Jesus comes along and he starts talking about humility, which totally deflates the Pharisees' agenda. The Pharisees are the religious people. They think they're better than all of us because they've done some uh, and, and attained some amazing works, okay? Um, and Jesus comes along and he lays this out in Matthew 5, 5. He says, blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Now, the meek is the humble. But let me me help you with the picture of this because so many people look at the word of God and interpret the word of God merely in the time period that you are living on this earth. And the Bible says that our life is but a vapor. Our life is but a vapor. And so what happens is people read this and go, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And they're trying to figure out, well, why aren't we doing a better job on the earth then? Why aren't more humble people, you know, doing greater things in this earth? Because it's the prideful ones and it's the arrogant ones and it's, it's the ones that think that you're too stupid and I'm too stupid to figure out how to live. So they're going to tell you how to live and take away your natural gas because you might burn yourself and, and cows are farting too much. And so we're going to destroy the planet. Are, are you, come on. So, so how is this happening? Quit looking at it from the vapor time period that you're living on this earth. Look at it from an internal perspective. There's injustice that happens on this world, on this planet all the time. Bad things happen to good people. But don't just look at it in this point of view. There are some pastors that would basically tell you that the disciples were failures because they gave their life. They, they, they weren't prosperous. They have the greatest prosperity. They gave their life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're going to wear a crown that many of us will never wear. So we have to look at it from an eternal perspective that the meek shall inherit the earth. What does that mean? That means when we come, go to heaven with Jesus and we come back on this earth to rule and reign with him, guess what we're going to do? The humble are the ones that are going to be in charge. The humble are the ones that are going to be administrating this world with Christ Jesus. So some people think they think, well, we go to heaven, we're just gonna play video games all the time, and we're gonna we're we're gonna play a harp, wear diapers. Dear God help me. I don't want that heaven. <laughs> You're born in diapers, you die in diapers. I don't want to live in eternity in diapers. <laughs> so so the reality check is work is not a par- part of the curse of the fall. To work from the sweat of your brow is. To work with thorns and thistles and, and, and to work under the curse is, is the curse. But you have to understand Adam and Eve were working before the curse in the garden and it was a blessing. So we have to look at this verse from an eternal perspective. And so, first of all, I want you to see that meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not weakness. You're not a doormat. You don't just turn the other cheek to allow yourself to be punched. The Bible does tell you to turn the other cheek, but that's not in the case of a physical assault. That's not what it's talking about. It's verbal assault, and and that's where you allow Jesus to be your defense. You don't have to defend yourself in a verbal attack. Okay? But meekness is not weakness. Meekness refers to exercising God's strength under his control exercising God's strength under his control, demonstrating power without undue harshness. Harshness. So this is where, you know, you see the, the we, we, we think they're kind of crazy or lunatics. You know, they go out and they scream at people and yell at people and, and bark like dogs and do just crazy stuff when in, in the face of opposition because they can't communicate because they know that they don't have the words to defend the stupidity that they're defending. 
See, that's why there's a harshness. There's a harshness. But meekness isn't harsh. Meekness is the ability to stand and have unwavering standards. It's the ability to stand and have unwavering standards. I think about parents that go to the school board meetings and stand and have unwavering standards to hold these crazy people that are trying to to sexualize our kids and destroy the minds and the purity of our kids. Now, it's important though to understand that meekness, you can be angry and not sin. See, anger's not sin. See, be angry but sin not. The, The thing is, is how do you process your anger? What do you do with your anger? See, you can be angry, you can have a righteous indignation, you can be mad about the things that God is mad about. You can be upset about the things that God is upset about. But the thing is, is you have to figure out how to process it in a godly way. So anger itself isn't sin, it's how you process it can become sinful. Meekness is the ability to be kind but assertive, not to be a pushover. The ability to fight and not be cruel. The ability to fight and not be cruel. How about in times of war? In times of war, there's times to fight and there's times to allow people to surrender. Okay? It's the ability to speak truth and not lose control. The ability to have emotions but not be ruled by them. Now, here's a fat fact. Are you ready? PH, fat. For my gangsters out there, okay? (laughs) God hates pride. I think it's important that we understand what God hates. And I think the church has absolutely fallen into lunacy here in America because so many people that are church buildings or organizations that call themselves churches have embraced pride. Celebrate pride. Proverbs 8.13 says, all who fear the Lord will hate evil. Therefore, I hate pride and arrogance, corruption, and perverse speech. Look at that. I hate pride and arrogance, corruption, and perverse speech. God hates this. How dangerous is it to embrace something that God hates? How dangerous is it to celebrate something that God hates and detests? And, and this is where, you know, I look at, and isn't it amazing how the devil has named it the pride flag? The pride flag. And there are churches, you can, you can drive through, through Puyallup and Tacoma and you can see churches that hang the pride flag in celebration of pride, arrogance, corruption, and perverse speech. God hates it. Oh, but we have to be diverse. We have to be inclusive. We have to have equity. Equity for who? Equity for who? Because you know one thing I found, you know, when when Ferguson, the attorney general, put together his domestic violent extremist program uh, in tandem with the uh, uh, FBI and working with Homeland Security to figure out how they're going to address these domestic violent extremists, they were putting together a a board or a committee and you'll see every religion represented but Christianity. Hmm. Yeah, a lot of diversity, isn't there? Interesting. See, the problem with America is we've misplaced the importance on people that aren't important. We put importance on people that aren't important, professional athletes and actors. Oh, wow, you're really good at a sport, but you suck at marriage and being a parent. Yeah, let's listen to what you have to say. You're on your seventh marriage. 
You sleep around, but you know what? When they get up and speak because they got money and they've been on the silver screen, we need to give them importance. Their words need to carry weight. And here, here we take God's word and we kick it out, even though they're speaking directly against it. And what has happened is this has crept into the church to where we have Hollywood pastors now. Hollywood pastors that uh, are, are, are in, and can I just say this? Just because they're popular doesn't mean God raised them up. Just because they have a big platform does not mean that God gave them that platform. Because the Bible says that people will raise up teachers with itching ears. They have itching ears and they want to hear that. So what are they going to, they're going to elevate. The devil can elevate people that have a title pastor. Why? Because they're lukewarm. They're milk toast. They're sop. Because they're not preaching the word of God. And suddenly because somebody's popular, they need to give them a lot of influence and we need to give them a lot of weight to what they say and a lot of credibility. Are we on sneakers and preachers? Ooh. You're looking at my shoes now, aren't you? <laughs> I knew that. I knew, I knew. I will never be on that. I, right? I, I walked in. I was with Jack one time and we were in the Dubai mall and we walked into Prada. I was with a pastor one time, and I'm like, dude, those are cool shoes. What are those? He goes, Prada. And I went, what's that? <laughs> you know, I, I was missing my toothpick. What was that? <laughs> I didn't know that was a line of clothing and shoes. <laughs> Remember, I went to special ed, okay? So, <laughs> so we walked into the store, and I see Prada. If you have Prada, God bless you, okay? But... I walked in and I looked at the, and the, and the person come over and, 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 and I looked at the price on the shoes and they were like $1,500. And they said, would you, would you like to try them on? I said, no, they're just not my color. I just, <laughs> nah, I just, not interested today. <laughs> no, these are, these are my kind of shoes. Can you, can you pull in on that? You, anybody see what that says? Yeah. What? No bull. Amen. That's how I preach. No bull. <laughs> Proverbs 16.5. The Lord detests the proud. They will surely be punished. The Lord detests the proud. Do you want to know what the Bible says about Sodom and Gomorrah? Ezekiel 16.49 said, Sodom's sins were pride. What? What? Pride. What does God hate? Pride. You know what is the basis of pursuing your sexual freedom? Pride. Self-gratification. Doing what you want, when you want, how you feel it. It's hedonism at its finest. The pursuit of personal happiness and personal fulfillment for the moment that you're in. So Sodom's sins were pride, gluttony, and laziness. It sounds like America. While the poor and the needy suffered outside her door. She was proud and committed detestable sins, so I wiped her out as you have seen. So pride is what God hates, but then Jesus comes along. He gave up all of his royalty, put on human flesh. Matter of fact, Philippians 2.5 is showing us the example that we are to follow as born-again Christians, okay? Now, if you don't want to do this, then don't be a Christian, if you don't want to walk in humility, don't be a Christian. Just embrace pride while you can because hell's hot. Eternity's a long time, so enjoy it while you got. But Philippians 2.5 says you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God. What is that? Equity. He, right? What, what do we hear the world yelling? Equity. Yeah. Equity. Humility doesn't raise you to a higher standard. Humility says, I'm being compared not to human standard, but to God's standard. So he said, he did not think of equality with God as some would cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave, under, underscore that, and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. 
So what happened after he humbled himself? It says, therefore, say therefore. Therefore Therefore means, let me tell you what this is there for. All right? God elevated him to the place of the highest honor, gave him the name above all of the names, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Everybody's gonna be humbled. Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now this is our example. This is what the Bible is telling us to do, that we should follow this example. And so if God hates pride, he loves humility. So let's look at our role now. Because Jesus is the example, let's look at our role in 1 Peter 5.5. It says, and all of you, who? All. All. That's every born again believer, there's no exceptions. All of you dress yourself in humility as you relate to one another, for God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourself under the mighty power of God and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Okay, I wanna unpack this. Say dress. Dress Dress in the King James, it uses the word gird. Gird yourself up. Uh, Same would go to the armor of God. Gird up your loins, okay? But gird here literally means to put on something I brought this. This was a gift. I do not proclaim this over myself. Somebody actually did this. I did not print this up and say, yes, I made an apron. You guys made this up for me and the kids signed it and everything. I don't know if they believe it or not, but. But to gird means to clothe or dress yourself. But not in the way that we would think putting on clothing because you already have on clothing. So this is to say that you're to put on something to distinguish you from others. To gird here is the term that would be used as a slave would put on an apron to say, I'm ready to work. And and a slave... In the, in, the, in the days that this was written, the slave would gird them up, tie it in a knot so it doesn't come off, and therefore they are distinguished from other people. You've clothed yourself, you've put something on, and I have separated, this is my uniform as a born again believer, I have girded myself in humility. I have girded myself in God's expectation of my role. What this means is when somebody dresses in humility, you should be able to notice it. There should be an immediate impression. Like if somebody put this on social media, please don't. If somebody puts it, because why is pastor wearing a dress? (laughs) I'm not. It's a hospital gown, see? (laughs) Whoever designed them, it was a joke, I'm sure. You're like, when somebody sees me wearing this, they're like, what is he wearing? Why does he have that on? There's a distinction. There's, there, when, when you clothe or you gird yourself up, it is an intentional purpose to say, I am now taking on a role and a responsibility. And it doesn't come natural. I have to put it on. I have to dress myself in this. In the reality, we are only here to serve God and God alone. But as we serve God, we end up serving God's children. As we serve God's children, it's not something that we take on and off whenever we want. It's something that we live with. We clothe ourselves. We gird ourselves with this, with this humility that we don't get to just say, well, I'm going to take it off right now. We own it. It becomes a part of who we are. If we, if we think that we can just take it off and put it on, we call that acting, and acting is called lying. 
So this is where humility says that we're not only just here to serve God, but we're here to serve others. And when you clothe yourself in humility and you gird yourself and you tie that on, when you come into the body of Christ, you say, where can I help? Where can I serve? Not who can serve me. Because look, let's face it, you know, we, we had the seeker sensitive movement. Let's, let's be really sensitive to those that are looking for, for you know, other options in life. And, and so we'll make church really fun and, and relatable. And, and so we'll be very sensitive to seekers. And what we did was we created sensitive Christians. Like, like somehow they've come to the five-star restaurant and if they don't get the service that they want, they leave a nasty review. Who gives a church a one-star review? Well, John Chris, he, he was going through church reviews one time and, and somebody gave a church a one-star review because they had pie afterwards and the pie wasn't very good. <laughs> well, one star. People are so arrogant. Our hearts should be, I want to come in and serve. And, and, and yes, there's transitional times in, in life and, and what we, we understand that, that you, you, you may not be in a position to serve in that season. But when you have the heart of Christ, you just don't sit on the sideline. You're not sitting in, in your, your balcony over here, this seat over here, and say, I'm going to watch the show entertain me. This is not the Colosseum in Rome where we come to be entertained and give me bread and, and drink. See, pride is the trigger for God's anger. Humility is the trigger for God's grace. You get to decide which trigger you want to pull. You like that? I do that for free. Check it out. Matthew 23, 12 tells us this. Remember, pride is the trigger for God's anger. Humility is the trigger for God's grace. It says this, Matthew 23, 12, but those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So we need to understand that Humbling yourself, James 4.10, go down guys quite a bit, go down quite a bit. James 4.10 says, humble yourself before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Put on your robe, put on your apron, put on and leave it on. Clothe yourself and then you watch God open doors because he knows when you go through that door, you're going through the door for the right reason. Remember, meekness is not weakness. Humility is not being a doormat. Certainly not being a punching bag. Ladies, you need to understand that. No husband should lay a hand on you. And if he does, we will help pray his hand off his body. It's unacceptable. No excuse, no apology, no unacceptable. Don't believe a lie. Don't buy into the lie. It is unacceptable. What caused that? Pride. Arrogance. So you're not a punching bag just because you're humble. Humility doesn't mean that you're an easy target. Our secret service needs to learn that. Humility is not being naive. Willfully naive, well, I just don't want to know. It's not weakness. It's not self-deprecating. Oh, me? Who am I? Don't demean the tool that God made you. In other words, you are a tool. Don't be a tool. Be God's tool. It's not a lack of confidence. It's not indifference, it's not being fearful, it's not being submissive. Just because you're humble doesn't mean you have to submit. If it goes against the word of God, if it goes against the will of God, you don't have to submit to it, but you can, you can still be humble and kind and gracious, but say, no, I'm not gonna do it. What about the three Hebrew children that were standing there and, and when King Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm gonna play the music, when I play the music, you bow. Oh, we, we gotta be respectful. 
No. No. Hey, you got to do what you do. I'm going to do what I do. See, they were respectful while being humble, but didn't submit. Humility is not being fearful, and it's not seeking approval from other people. The greatest form of humility is being able to serve other people, help other people achieve what they can't by themselves. And and so many people say, I want to get to the summit. I want to go up. I want to achieve. But if you understand that if you can help somebody else summit, you will be at the summit too. And then you have somebody to take a photo with. There was a Sherpa here recently helping a, a climbing team. He was hired to help this climbing team go up. And uh, they were almost to the summit and there was a man laying there. He was not able to move and he was gonna die. A lot of people die up there. And um, so he called off the climb and he wrapped that man in a sleeping bag and wrapped him in an, another uh, soft piece of, uh, it's, it's what you lay on to sleep on in the snow. Wrapped him in that, put him on his back, and carried him six miles down the hill, down the mountain. Six miles to save his life. Sometimes you have to understand what's more important. Getting to the top and say, look what I did, or helping somebody get back down. Humility will cost you, but it pays huge huge dividends in eternity. That's why Ephesians 4.22 says, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Throw off, say throw off. Oh, years ago, we were gone on vacation and we came back and I forgot to set the garbage out. And um, it, was, it was pretty full. And it was hot, summer days, good stretch. And so we got back and, you know, I went to take the garbage out and I couldn't fit it all in. So, you know, I'm very, very ingenuitive, you know. So I did the only smart thing I knew. I got up and put my foot and I started pushing myself down into the garbage. And you know the corner of the bottom of the garbage bag? And, and when I went to put pressure, the corner of the garbage bag went, and the point was like right at, have you ever seen those cake things that you squeeze? And, and so I'm standing, and now all my pressure, and I'm just going down, and I see the bag come up, and I go, dear God. And that thing exploded. Boof! It went up my shirt, in my face, in my mouth, in my hair, and I had maggots everywhere. Yes, yes, enjoy it, enjoy it. I screamed like a little six-year-old girl. I wasn't proud of the moment. I was not very manly. run into the house, jump in the shower, crank the hot water on, clothes and all, and I'm just praying in tongues. Oh, God! (laughs) I took those nasty garments off and I threw them away. I don't ever want to be reminded of that moment again when I wear, oh, yeah, I had maggots on this shirt. Well, I, (laughs) right? And, you know, soap. (laughs) Maggots falling in, like, stomping them down the drain. It was awesome. (laughs) How many believers are walking around with maggot-covered clothes? Yeah, that's past life, but you haven't taken it off and you've not put on the garment that God has for you. And, and you know, 
With pride, there is a stench. Oh, there was a stench coming out of that bag. Okay? And with pride, there is a stench. But with humility, there's a fragrance. You just want to be around that. Oh, that smells good. Remember when grandpa would walk in and it's like, Old Spice is home. Ah! (laughs) There's a fragrance about humility, but you know what? If you're not born again, there's a stench that's going to take you to hell. But you, you, can, you can change clothes. You, you can make the difference right here, right now. You can surrender your life to Jesus Christ. You can say, Jesus, be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sins. Because the wages of sin is death. It's hell. It's eternal. It's fire. It's punishment. That's what the Bible tells us. And this is why Jesus humbled himself, put on humility, sacrificed himself, died a criminal's death for you and I, and rose again so that now we can rise again so today if you want to be born again maybe for the first time or you want to renew your commitment bow your heads with me close your eyes if you're here today and you you want to surrender to Jesus I want you to lift your hand right now Jesus said if you acknowledge me before others I will acknowledge you before my father in heaven if that's you just lift your hand right now we're going to pray a prayer of salvation lift it up so I can see you this isn't an auction This is your moment to choose Christ Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If that's you today, anyone at all. All right, let's pray with those that are watching live on the internet. Heavenly Father, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin. I accept your son Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Live in me as I live for you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen, amen.